Hello and welcome to this masterclass on copycat products. My name is James Wymark and I'm a senior associate in the IP team at Baker McKenzie in London. I specialise in all areas of IP enforcement including trademarks, designs and passing off with a particular focus on brand protection. Today I'll be talking to you about lookalike products and the problems they pose for brand owners and in particular looking at whether there are registered or unregistered rights that can be relied upon, how to use survey or other evidence to back up those rights and where the law may be going in the future. Generally speaking, lookalike products use the same features, so they might use the same shape, the same colour, the same design, but predominantly they don't contain brand names or at least well-known brand names. If they're copying brand names, then they're just counterfeit products. The strongest position to take is to use a registered IP right. This gives you something that you can wave in front of an infringer rather than relying on unregistered rights where you have to prove your entitlement beforehand. In terms of lookalike products, probably the strongest right, if you are able to rely upon it, is trademark rights. When dealing with lookalikes using trademarks, there's three areas that you can rely upon. Um, as with all trademark enforcement cases, you can either rely on there being a claim under Section 10.1 of the Trademarks Act, Section 10.2, or Section 10.3. Section 10.2 requires you to have there a, a mark that is similar to a registered trademark for similar or identical goods and services. However, the rub here is it has to show that there's a likelihood of confusion. And with lookalike products, that tends to be an area, again, where brand holders fall down. Because often consumers aren't confused. They know they're buying a cheaper lookalike product. Section 10.3, if you can get within it, is a very strong right and gives you a lot of power against lookalike products. However, there's a, a, an initial prerequisite, which often means that you can't get that to that level. You need to have a mark with a reputation. A good example of um, the application of Section 10.3 was the recent Specsavers and Asda case. It was clear that it was an Asda promotion and nobody was confused. However, the court nevertheless found that there was an infringement because they said that Specsaver was so well known that people would think there'd be some sort of link. So for community harmonised designs, the key features are that it covers 2D and 3D designs, that it um, covers surface decoration, which is of strong application for lookalike products. Um, and in terms of showing infringement, the key test is to show whether the lookalike product gives the same or a different overall impression to the informed user. If no registered rights available, then obviously unregistered rights are your fallback. And this is not an uncommon position. Lots of brand holders forget to register things, or as we've discussed, don't realize that it's necessary to register them. So there are three main unregistered rights that you can rely upon. There are equivalent unfair competition rights around Europe, but for UK, passing off is really what's relied upon if there's no registered rights available. Penguin was the well-known product, Puffin was the lookalike produced by Asda, and in that case, the court said that there was a passing off, they tried to live dangerously and they just gone the wrong side of the line. One of the early iterations of the Puffin product had been a bison bar. And it, the court said that if you used a bison bar, there'd be no passing off. It's often important to demonstrate that there is some form of confusion involved in order to show that there's an infringement. Confusion is difficult to demonstrate and unless you have a setup where, for example, you have a complaints line that records these kinds of incidents, it's difficult to gather that information. So often, um, brand holders will then rely upon survey evidence. Now, survey evidence is a bit of a double-edged sword. You have to put some evidence in, or at least the court would expect you to put some evidence in, but you'll roundly criticise of putting that evidence in pretty much in every case. When setting up your survey, there are three things you have to consider. Firstly, who do you survey? Secondly, where do you conduct that survey? But once you've got over those two points, the key, key situation is, how do you determine what questions to ask? There are very few uh, surveys that have been successful. One of the ones that is a good example is in the Neutrogena Neutralia case. In this case, um, the uh, legal team put together a fake promotion within a shop. The key thing to remember is that registered rights are king. So if you are able to put a registration strategy in place that provides you with strong protection, that's obviously an advantage. However, you do have to consider that there is a cost versus benefit analysis here. Overall, you need to take a very holistic approach. You need to combine all these things, and if possible, consider early on in your development of your product whether you want to register particular rights to give you an ability to tackle lookalike products.